Thank you very much for joining us here on News Desk. And, uh, well, you do know that tomorrow, Friday, tomorrow being the first Friday in the month of December, is Farmer's Day. It happens to be a holiday as well. Now, what does the average farmer feel about this? I mean, there's been a lot of talk about Farmer's Day celebration and all, but really, what does the average farmer feel about this? Are farmers reaping the fruits of their labor? Charles Nyaba is Programs Director of the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana. He joins me live now in studio to help us understand uh, what it is that they, they are looking forward to as we celebrate another edition of Farmers Day. Uh, Sonia, ba, good morning. Thank you very much for good joining morning. us. So it, it, it ought to be a great day for you, but is, it, is that really the case? Uh, yeah, um, we can say we are not happy. Uh, but before I even go ahead to make any statement, mm -hmm. I would like to with all smallholder farmers in the country, a happy Farmers Day. Sure. Uh, since it's a day meant for us to celebrate, I think uh, we should be happy for the day. Uh, but we think that uh, we still have a long way to go if we actually want farmers to be happy celebrating Farmers Day. So is it that uh, we as a people have not placed so much emphasis on farming, per se? Uh, yeah, I must say that uh, if you look at the farming, majority of uh, those who actually contribute to the sector are smallholder farmers, and they are about 90% of the farmer population. And if you look at most of uh, the investment that we make in the sector, and then also the reward that we give, it goes to the few less than 10% who are also in the sector, mm -hmm. who are the commercial farmers, those who produce more than 10 to 50 acres. There are very few in the, in the, in the sector. If you want to trace the history of awards given to farmers on Farmers Day, you realize that hardly do you see smallholder farmers, exactly. and for that matter, women farmers getting awards. Meanwhile, the majority of the sector, they contribute more to the food need, they contribute to the GDP, and all the things that we can talk about. So we are thinking that though we are happy uh, that uh, this day has been set aside for us to celebrate, uh, there are a few awards that we get at the district and the regional level, but when it comes to the national Best Farmer Award. A very few of us actually benefit from that, so which we think uh, we, 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 we must uh, take a second look at. So as peasant farmers, you want government to pay much more attention to your, your association, for instance. Let's, let's just look. Because like you say, you form a majority part of uh, the farming community here yeah. in, in Ghana, right? Yeah. So what exactly is it? Let, let's, look at, let's talk about the challenges. Let's see how demanding or challenging it is for you to even have access to credit facilities yeah, yeah. To, to see through some of these pro yeah. projects you do. You know, access to credit in Africa for smaller holder farmers has been a problem ever since. Uh, the same issues were also confronting developed countries like US and then a, a EU, Brazil, and China. But they were able to actually come up with a, a modern ways of uh, delivering credit to farmers. Okay. So the issue of uh, access to credit for rural farmers or smallholder farmers in those countries have reduced significantly. Now, we have come up with uh, a number of packages that we think that if you move away from the traditional way of giving credit to farmers and then we take this approach, it will be able to, if not even addressing all the challenges of access to credit, at least it will minimize it. What do we talk about? Now we have what we call a uh, bundling credit with insurance. Because the uh, majority of uh, financial institutions don't actually have interest in giving credit to smallholder farmers because of the, the risks factor. involved. Yeah. Apart from the risks, the overhead expenses that they will incur in giving credit to uh, 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 rural farmers is very high. Mm. Because we see a very few farmers located in a place, and each is taking about 1,000 500, 2,000, 3,000. So it means you need to incur additional costs to let your personnel go there to train them on how to process the credit, how to take the credit, and even recovery, and then monitoring. So it's very high. Now, there are a, 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 a number of um, uh, strategies that we can use to minimize these over, overhead uh, uh, expenses and also to reduce the, cred, uh, the risks involved in that, which we think that if you move away from the traditional way of doing it, uh, we'll be able to address those challenges. And it involves subsidies, because uh, a typical financial institutions will not uh, be ready to incur those additional costs or expenses to do those things. So the government can come in, 
in the aim of trying to address uh, the, 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 the challenges and giving credits to those people by subsidizing uh, the additional expenses to make it easier for any financial institution to be attracted to provide credit to the rural farmer, especially the women. That's, that's quite interesting. But I want us now to focus on uh, the youth in farming. Yeah. particularly. Yeah. For many, including myself, yeah. it, it seems to be a problem because uh, not many of the youth are really interested in going into farming now. Yeah. Now, is, from where I sit, it looks like a problem. Is that really a problem from where you say, Or probably there are a lot more youth yeah. in farming than I think. Yeah, there is. Uh, the majority are those who have not been able to attain a certain level of education. Because the way we made our youth to see the farming, mm. Actually, they are seeing it as a place that is meant for dropouts, a place that is meant for people who have no other option than to go in there, which we think it shouldn't be the case. Farming is a very profitable venture. Last year, I just tried to demonstrate that to some few youth in the, some of the districts by going in to do farming. And at the end of the day, I told them that, look, what I've gotten, if I was to be working in a former sector, the whole year I wouldn't have gotten that. Mm. It's just to motivate them to go in. Now, I also do agree why some youth are not interested in going because of the risk issue. Now, this year, you realize that um, areas where we were supposed to experience rainfall around May, the rains actually came around uh, July. Yeah. And then by the close of October, the rain stopped. Yeah. So it then becomes very riskier because if you put all investment there and at the end of the day, there's no enough rain, then it means you lost it. So what we need to do as a country is look at how can we mitigate that. We have to begin thinking of creating smaller, smaller, smaller irrigation systems, which will make it possible for farmers to go in so that in case there is no rainfall, at least those people will still uh, be able to get something. But, but, but let's look at measures put in by government to get the youth into some of these things, particularly agriculture. I mean, there's been, yes, there's been, yeah, that's the Youth Employment Agency with a lot of models uh, in farming as well, as, I mean, as, as, uh, as well as a number of other issues. Do you think this is enough? Uh, it's, it's, it's not enough. Uh, normally, we don't want to go into discussing about uh, uh, the strategies that uh, we are using in terms of yes and then other things to address oh, or you to encourage with, you with, because with, with how it's uh, being rolled out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we have problem with that. You see, if you want to actually address the challenges in agriculture, we have to make people see it as a business. So anybody who is going in there knows that I'm investing this and I'm expecting to get this. So that the first year, if you're able to make this progress, the following year, your colleagues would like to join. But if you make it in a way that the person only comes in and at the end of the day, somebody will say, no, oh, we'll be able to deliver this. Meanwhile, in real sense, those who are involved are not benefiting much from it. I don't think uh, that's the approach we should take. There are several models that have been developed by uh, the focus of our uh, agri department, uh, University of Ghana, um, UDS, which are very, very, very motivational, which I think that if our, our, our policymakers adopt or they consult those people, to help implement youth programs that will benefit the youth. It will, it will yield more benefit than what we are doing now. So I think we need to, to, to go uh, beyond that. Yeah. I can just cite uh, one example about uh, some young guys that are encouraged and they went into rice farming this year in the Fumbisi and the Nasir Valleys. These guys were able to actually produce the rice. It looks good. It was ready for harvesting they couldn't get combined harvesters. They call everywhere. To the extent that I have to also call my, my, my friends in Sada to find out whether they could help them with combined harvesters to harvest their rice. But they said that oh, Sada don't have a, a, a combined facilities. So this is what we are talking about. Mm. The rice yielded well. It was ready for harvesting. But the fear was that uh, they are likely resources. to lose everything. Because yeah, normally when you go to that part of the country, you realize that when the dry season is setting in, people set up a fire in other things, so it destroys it. Mm -hmm. So those are the problems. How do we make uh, 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 access to mechanization very easy for a youth who went into farming and then he need mechanization services? Because we are moving away from using hose and cutlasses. Exactly. And our labor is becoming scarce. Yeah. You understand? So if you want to do, let's forget about just giving people money, take this and go and do this. But rather try to make access to input available to those people. When you do that, then it becomes very easier. I keep talking about financial subsidy, we support it. But we think that there is a way we can do it for everybody to benefit. And at the end of the day, we all get 
the profit from why we are doing it. But if you continue doing it the way we do in the past, I think at the end of the day, very few people who end up benefiting. A majority of those who need those uh, 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 facilities might not, uh, uh, in, in real sense, get it. Uh, I was just looking through the 2016 uh, budget yeah. that has been read. Uh, there are a few things that the uh, government promised they are going to do, which I think if they do it, uh, it will be good. They said they are going to create deck, uh, about uh, 3,000 or so uh, dugouts uh, around the rural community to make it possible for the rural people to have access to water to do farming during the mm -hmm. drying season. Yeah. And they also promised they will be buying some tractors and east co uh, uh, components and other uh, facilities. These are very good. Uh, okay, so from uh, what you said, you see that as good. But on another scale, one would say a government investing just about 1.1% of GDP into agriculture is woefully, it's woefully, woefully inadequate. In uh, the point I was even making is that, you know, certain times we see this and keep uh, repeating in the budget, but when it comes to actual implementation, it becomes a problem. Government investment in agriculture, just like we all agree at the uh, Mapoto Declaration, yeah. that at least we invest 10%, which is supposed to yield 6% growth. Um, what we are seeing in the budget is far, far, far inadequate. Yeah. Uh, even though it's more than the 1.1%, uh, because certain times when the politicians talk, uh, you are tempted to go by that. Mm. Uh, how we calculate uh, government investment in agriculture, normally you don't take only the money that goes into MOFA. You look at what goes into fisheries, what goes into for forestries, what goes into feeder roads that links farming communities to the nearest market center. Then if you add all that, then you are able to say that, oh, this is how much government is actually putting into agriculture. Right. And, and, and for you, that may be big enough, but your concern it's, has it's to... It's not still enough. It's, yeah, it may not be enough, but yeah. at least it's quite substantial. It's, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's more than 1.1%, okay. but it's still far, far below what we agree in Mo, uh, Moputo, Moputo that we'll be doing. But your issue has to do with we seeing these same things repeat themselves in the budgets yeah. subsequent. I mean, yeah. ev it keeps happening every yeah. year. So yeah. what are the assurances that this is not going to be any different? So that, that's the point. That's the point I wanted to make that those things that they put in the budget is commendable if they actually go ahead to implement them. And even the figure that they put there uh, in the budget, even though it's small, but if they should actually send all that into what the money is uh, expected to be done. At least we make some progress. But at the end of the day, uh, when you try to track and see how much has actually gone into uh, those things that they promised to do, you realize that we are not getting all what they promised to do. Mm -hmm. So those are the challenges. So we, we actually think that uh, the commitment, commitment to improving the agriculture sector is not yet there. We are, we are not actually seeing that much. Uh, sometimes when you see certain uh, statements made, you are happy because I saw that um, the team for this year's uh, Farmers Day is Develop Ghana, Invest in Agriculture. So it's a very nice team that mm. anybody who is in the, in, the, in the sector should be happy of. But at the end of the day, are we doing that? Mm. That's the problem. See. Look, there are a lot of youth who are ready to go into agriculture. Oh, myself included. If, if, if mm. we address those challenges and mm. try to give them a very good package that will enable them to go. Look, any part of the world, they've been able to go through agriculture by introducing some innovation and technology. Yeah. How do we make this technology available to the youth who want to go in there? Right. There are hybrid seeds, there mm -hmm. are improved seeds, there are in improved um, um, uh, 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 livestock varieties, there are improved pot pottery varieties. Mm -hmm. But access to those breeds are very, very difficult. That is the problem seeds. now. Mr. Nyaba, uh, we will we'll really continue with this discussion probably tomorrow. Tomorrow is uh, Farmer's Day, so obviously we would love to have you back in the studio tomorrow. And uh, that was uh, Charles Nyaba, who is with the National Peasant Farmers Association. He joined us live in studio. And uh, as we build up to that particular celebration tomorrow, as we honor and celebrate our farmers here in Ghana. But that's how we wrap up our news desk this morning. My name is Kwabna Chen Chenhine Boating. Uh, as usual, you could always log on to myjournline.com for some more news. But time now for Journeys Interactive with Nia Kofi Smart Abbey.